evening and welcome to the programme in which I hope you'll find that you can participate. There's a chance you might recognise a wanted suspect or a missing piece of evidence, and if so, the detectives gathered here behind us are waiting for your call. The programme's live, the cases are under active investigation. They each need you to help complete the picture. Among this month's inquiries, the discovery in Folkestone late on Guy Fawkes night of an abandoned blood-stained taxi which has led to a full-scale murder inquiry. The robbers on Merseyside, who've committed a series of attacks on wealthy-looking homes and who've become progressively more violent, and lonely pensioner Harry Howell used to like telling people about the money he'd saved up. But that boast may have cost him his life. For our first reconstruction tonight, we go to Folkestone on the coast of Kent, but it's a case that could involve witnesses from anywhere in Britain, since Folkestone is a busy gateway to the continent and it's the entrance on the English side to the Channel Tunnel. Were you in Folkestone on Guy Fawkes night? If so, you might help solve the murder of a local cab driver. From the Channel Ferry Terminal, it's five miles up the coast to Hythe. On Saturday the 5th of November, as darkness fell and bonfires were lit, the pubs were unusually busy. The fountain at the bottom of Horn Street was no exception. Mary Reed had been trying to help customers get home. Hello. Um, can I order a taxi, please, at the fountain? <laughs> Half an hour's wait. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we'll have to try another company. At 12.20, Mary finished work and set off home. There was this taxi sitting in the lay-by and I thought, oh, we've been trying all evening. And there's one sitting there. But this one was empty. And it wasn't till next day that anyone discovered why. When Derek Brown's taxi was found uh, at this location, the back seat was covered in blood. There is no doubt because of the amount of blood in the backseat of that taxi, that Mr. Brand is dead. This is now a murder inquiry. Our first priority now is to find the body. Because of the metre fare on the taxi, the car has travelled something like 31 and a half miles. The front wheels are covered in mud, so at the moment we are searching the Romney Marsh area. We have covered about a half of the area, but we are continuing our search there. Nearly two weeks later, a man's body was found dumped beside the London-bound carriageway of the M20. Derek Bran was new to taxi driving. He was 48, married with three sons. He put in a great deal of time for the local Lions Club, raising money for charity and doing welfare work. His main job was as an insurance salesman, but lately he turned to taxi driving in the evenings and at weekends to earn a bit of extra cash. He worked for the Folkestone Taxi Company, based above a snack bar in Sandgate Road. He shared a cab, this red Nissan Bluebird, with two other drivers. Just after lunchtime on Saturday the 5th, Derek took over from Brian James for the afternoon and evening shift. Hello, Brian. How was business this morning? Yeah, not so bad, Derek. Not so bad. Good. You should have a good night tonight. Well, I hope so, yeah. Night. Have a good night. OK. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Well, it's very pleasant to uh, chat, really. I'd only known him for about six weeks since he'd been starting taxi driving. I'll give it to you now. Watch sideways, Mrs. Moon, because I'm going to talk to the other champion and see us again. Right, Mike. Right, OK. Roger, on my way. As it happened, that particular afternoon we changed over, he did tell me how much he enjoyed the taxi driving. And uh, if the insurance business got much worse, he was thinking of taking that full time. Please. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a quiet afternoon on Guy Fawkes Day, and at about half past eight, Derek was home for supper. Where are the boys? Oh, Mark's out. Adrian and Aaron are upstairs. How was work? A bit quiet. What time will you be home tonight? Oh, we're busy tonight. Probably about three ish. Oh, well, I won't wait up then. No. Right up. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Folkestone Harbour. At 10 o'clock, outside the Burston Hotel, another taxi driver clearly remembers seeing Derek waiting in the rank. Where 
20 minutes later, Derek might have been seen again by this security guard on duty in Middleburg Square. He saw two men get into what he thinks was Derek's taxi. Evening. Where to then, Gov? Police know of no one who saw Derek after this. We can only theorise about what happened, but it is possible that Derek took a fare to somewhere in the Folkestone area. When he's asked for the fare, he's been stabbed, and they've decided, in blind panic, that they must take him to a hospital. The only casualty hospital is in the Ashford area, and they've driven him up the motorway, the M20. It has become apparent to them that he was already dead, and we know that the taxi stopped where the body was dumped. I don't think that Derek himself drove this cab out of the area because it was standard procedure for him to call into his control to say when he was leaving the Folkestone area. So I think we can safely bet the offender has driven the taxi. They know the taxi stopped where the body was dumped because it was noticed by a couple driving past. Watch it on his old bill. No, it's not, it's a taxi. Five miles later, they saw the cab turn off at junction 10. At about the same time, a man was seen walking down the verge beside the hard shoulder, back in the direction of Folkestone. We we'll believe this man leaving the taxi was one of the attackers and has made his way down the motorway. Meanwhile, the taxi itself has been sighted sometime shortly after 11 in this area of the Romney Marsh. I'm an ambulance driver who drives down through the marsh every night. And when I was driving along, didn't see many cars. And I come across a taxi moving slowly. I had to brake hard. I thought it was really unusual to see a Folkestone taxi out in the marsh. The taxi headed back to Folkestone. And at about 11.15, a cab was seen at the bottom of Horn Street. It seemed to have overshot the road. J.I.B. for Mr. Perrett. Just a couple of minutes, Yankee. Joe Finney, Derek Brown had been stabbed 34 times, I gather. That's correct. There can be absolutely no doubt that his assailant was covered in blood. And we would like to appeal to anyone who has had a relative, a friend, anyone they know on bonfire night come home with blood on their clothing. With perhaps an excuse that they was they were helping someone else who got injured on Guy Fawkes Night by a bonfire or firework or something like that. But I gather the assailant also cut themselves. The forensic scientists uh, have told us that there are two types of blood in that taxi. So undoubtedly, this person has cut himself. OK, now the man we saw walking back towards Folkestone on the verge of the M20, you feel pretty confident that he was involved in this crime? Logic would dictate that he was involved in this offence. It is possible that uh, he wished to disassociate himself, that he went along maybe for the theft, maybe in order to run away from the taxi without paying the fare. Uh, and when the taxi, when they had eventually to dump the body, he's decided he doesn't want to have anything more to do with it and he's walked off rather than stay in the taxi. OK, well, if that guy wants to ring in, he might do himself a favour if he wants to disso dissociate himself from the murder. Since we filmed the reconstruction, I gather you've got evidence there was a white van seen behind the cab parked on the hard shoulder of the M20. That's correct. A white van was parked very close behind it, a matter of feet. Uh, where the taxi had its sort of indicator lights all flashing all four, and this van was directly behind it. Now, it could have been involved in a sort of conspiracy to get rid of the body. It could have just been a passerby who stopped seeing a, what he thought was a car in, in trouble with its warning hazard lights on, presumably. So, again, he wants to come Obviously, forward. Obviously, we would like him to come forward. About please. 11 o'clock, November the 5th, 10, 11 o'clock sometime in the evening. About half 10. Now, when we saw the car go past Horn Street, the cab, and Horn Street, I should say, is the street where the Fountain Pub is, yes, it seemed sir. to overshoot it and then move back again. Somebody who saw that got a very good look at the driver. And you've got an artist's impression. That is correct. Uh, in fact, it was a witness who saw the taxi entering the area as he left it. Uh, we have got a good artist's impression. The witness himself is pleased with this impression, and we would ask for anyone who knows 
a person who looks like this to contact us. OK, a lot of clues there. This was a murder, it seems, with a theft of 50 or 60 quid. If you have any information you think might help, here's the number, 01811 8055, or Folkestone Police Station. You can call that on 0303 850055. That's 0303 for Folkestone, 850055. And as a look at the results of last month's cases so far, police are still following up a large number of calls on the murders of double glazing salesman David Short and of prostitute Linda Donaldson. But there are no positive leads as yet on those two. Our third reconstruction was the armed robbery of a security van outside Lloyds Bank in Grays, Essex, by two men who then escaped on motorbikes. On this case, police have received some excellent information and for the moment that's all we're able to say. Also on last month's Crime Watch, police asked for your help to find a man who was wanted in connection with a series of alleged frauds in and around Essex over the last two years. Now, as a direct result of that programme, a man has since been charged with six offences of obtaining property by deception. And in Glasgow, a 33-year-old man was arrested as a direct result, again, of a viewer's information. He's now in custody, charged in connection with an armed raid on a building society in Duke Street. Well, now to tonight's photo call, where we show you pictures, once again, of people police need to question in connection with their investigations. Here now is Superintendent David Hatcher. First, my colleagues in Blackburn want to speak to this man, Mark Thomas Elliott. He may have important information about a series of woundings which occurred in Blackburn last year. The last attack in October took place here on the Fishmore estate. The victim was struck around the body with a hammer and an attempt was made to break his arms and legs. Elliot is 26 years old, 6 foot 2 tall, with short dark hair. Give us a ring if you know where he is. Next, you recognise this couple. Their real names are Derek and Christine Kennard, but you may know them as the Parks or the Cannons, the Cooks or even the Roberts. My colleagues in Brecon in Wales would like to speak to them about a series of frauds from which over £120,000 has been obtained. The victims are persuaded to hand over large sums of money, often on the pretext of setting up business deals, buying cars or holiday flats abroad. The Kennards may have worked in East Anglia, the West Country and even Tenerife. Derek Kennard, who sometimes introduces himself as Del Boy, is 5 foot 9 inches tall, stocky, with tattoos on his arms. His wife is 5 foot 4 inches tall, slim and a smoker. If you know where they are, please get in touch. Next, a robber who was caught very clearly on a security camera. On Monday the 19th of December, this man went into a building society in Kilburn in London. He threatened the cashier with a gun that looked like a grey revolver and got away with nearly £2,000 in a plastic bag. The robber is in his mid-twenties. He's 5 foot 5 inches tall, slim, with very dark eyebrows. If that's a familiar face to you, please call us. There is a reward. Finally, we'd like your help to find this man, William Grant. We think he might have vital information about the attempted murder of James Rossborough. He was shot outside this hotel, the Buxton Manor, in Blackpool in the early hours of the 3rd of December. James Rossborough suffered severe injuries but is now making a reasonable recovery. We know William Grant was in Glasgow on the 5th of December, but where is he now? He's 25, 6 foot 2 tall, slim, with black hair and may have a beard now. If you've seen him or any of our photo call faces, call us now. And that's the number. If there's anyone you think you recognise, 01811 8055. Well, our next reconstruction is a series of armed robberies. There have been eight so far, which have all taken place around the south and southeast of Liverpool. The gang picks on wealthy looking houses while the owners are home for the evening. And because the gang is armed and because recently the robbers seem to be using more violence, Police are concerned to prevent the real possibility that if there's a next time, somebody could be killed. The most recent victims are a retired couple who've lived in their house for more than 30 years, having built it themselves in the 1950s. Now, after their ordeal, they're planning to move. Our reconstruction begins at their home in Liverpool. It's Thursday, the 17th of November. Mr Frank Perkins is 82 years old. He suffers from a heart condition and lives quietly with his wife, Pamela. Here you are, dear. Thanks very much. You ready for bed soon? Very shortly. Good. Tell me, how was Frank? Fine. Mrs Perkins had been shopping in London, so her housekeeper, Mary, had spent the day looking after Frank. As they chatted, they were unaware that someone was breaking in upstairs.
I was trying to look for that material. Don't move. <laughs> Just do as you're told and you won't get hurt. You over here. But I'll blow her brains out. Where's the back door? <laughs> move! Move! Any problems? No. Come here, you. Anyone else in the house? Yes, my husband. Where is he? In the bathroom, but please don't hurt him. He's a very sick man. I'll get him. <laughs> don't move! What the hell do you think you're doing? Just do as you're told and you won't get it. So come on, move it! Get in. Sit shut down up. and shut up. But you, where's the money? We don't keep any money in the house. The jewelry, then. Where's the jewelry? It's upstairs on my dressing table. Oh. What's that? Give us that. Not my mother's. Shut up. The robbers searched the house for more than an hour. They used a variety of accents, perhaps to confuse the victims, but police believe they are from Merseyside. Come here, let's oh, go! It's OK, I'm coming. Hurry up! And we've got your car! On several occasions, the gang have used the victims' own cars for their getaway. The Perkins White Golf was abandoned 200 yards from the house. The first robbery was almost exactly a year ago, and all the robberies since then have followed a similar pattern. By April, there'd been four attacks, and then they stopped. The next one was six months later, in October. But this time, something went wrong. It's Friday, the 7th of October. Mrs. Johnson was leaving home to do some shopping when she saw a man acting strangely. He seemed to be watching her. As she drove past him, he bent down as if to tie his shoelace. The next evening, Mr and Mrs Johnson were at home. Did you hear that? No. I thought I heard something outside. Do you see anything? No. Oh, I'll just take Oliver out. Okay. Come on, boy. Oliver, come on. No! Get down, you bastard! Come here, you! Get down! Get down! Come here, you! Come here, you! Get down! Get down! Get down! Shut up! Shut up! Fortunately, a neighbour heard the scuffle. Shut up. Shut up. Are you all right, Mr Johnson? Help. Hold on, I'll get me, Dad. Help. Dad. Help! Shut up! Please! Shut up. Let's get out of here! Help! As the robbers ran off, the neighbours got a good look at them. And one of them had taken his mask off. Okay. Nobody's been here, not been taken. No one's been here. They got away. Nobody saw where they went. But just ten days later, they tried again, and they seemed to have become more violent. The victim needed 45 stitches to his head. But on this occasion, there may be a clue. Again, the robbers stole the victim's car, a white Vauxhall Senator. And just 15 minutes later, a witness saw that car with two others parked very close to it. One was a red capri with a black roof, the other was a lime green escort. Well, often in cases like this, the cr criminal fraternity itself is so disgusted by the level of unnecessary violence that's used, and a fair proportion of Crime Watch cases are solved as a result of that. Detective Inspector Frank Hope is in charge of the case. First of all, where exactly is that lane where we saw the two cars have been abandoned on the 18th of October? Uh, Whitefield Lane is a country lane which has now uh, reached a dead end with the construction of the uh, M62 motorway. 
and it's um, about three quarters of a mile from the junction of the, <coughs> the M62 and the M57, and it's now more or less a lover's lane, and certainly if anyone was in that lane that night and saw these cars, uh, they can certainly phone us in strictest confidence and we'll take the information from them. Right. Now what about the robbers themselves? One of the neighbours we saw there took a good look at one of them who had his balaclava off. Perhaps we have, uh, we have a video fit of him, perhaps we could have a description. Yes, he's uh, in his mid-30s, he's about five foot eight inches tall, round face and very fat cheeks and he's got a very pronounced Liverpool accent. He's wearing dark uh, anorak and dark trousers. Right. We also have a video fit of the man who was seen watching one of the victim's houses in October. Yeah, this man was, was seen the day before uh, by the lady and she was so um, worried about him she actually drove around the block to have a good look at him again and she's fairly convinced he's one of the uh, people who robbed her on the, the following day. He's described as uh, late 20s, about 5 foot 6 inches tall, very thin build and uh, very prominent red cheeks. He's a, a very unusual feature about him. Now your main chance of tracing these robbers is likely to be through finding the stolen articles, some of which are pretty distinctive. There's an Indian headdress, for example. You've got a film of one very similar. Yes, this particular piece was um, uh, seen by the uh, lady um, of the person who was robbed. Uh, she was so impressed with it, she got him to uh, have it made for her in India. It's actually in five pieces. There's the part that goes over her head, uh, comes down to the back of the neck. There's uh, the large uh, necklace you can see earrings um, and an, an armlet that can go on either arm an unusual part on the hands where there's rings across and there's uh, gold and white pearls inset on that. Right. And also among the items were two very distinctive expensive Rolex watches. Yes, this, this particular watch is a, a, an exact copy of the watch that was stolen. This is the gentleman's watch with the blue face there. Unfortunately we haven't got a serial number for that watch. Uh, that is an exact replica that, of the one that was stolen. That's exactly, yes. What about the lady's watch? That's very distinctive and very valuable too, the one that was stolen. This particular watch is, is not quite exactly the same. Where the gold marks are, they've actually got diamonds inside. Mm. And this one, we have got a serial number for it. 9737678. 9737678. That's a serial number. If you know where those items are, it's obviously very important to trace these armed robbers before they get the chance to attack somebody else. So if you know something you think could help, please ring. The number here is 01811 The direct number to Merseyside Police is 051 708 That's 051 708 and do bear with us if they're engaged. There's a lot of information coming in at the moment on the Kennards, a number of suggested sightings already. One in particular includes information which uh, confirms its accuracy. On the Kilburn gunman, similar, uh, similarly a number of sightings, one from a police officer, which uh, ties in with another sighting from a member of the public. A number of names on the Folkestone taxi murder have been suggested, and an address has been given for Mark Elliott. We'll bring you more of that uh, as the programme goes on. Some news, though, from previous programmes that you might be interested in. I should stress none of these arrests has been as a direct result of Crime Watch calls. In November, we reconstructed the extraordinary raid on the Nat West Bank in Preston. The police lay siege outside, but the robbers had already escaped. The bank staff had been held at gunpoint and locked in the vaults. Two men and a woman have since been charged in connection with the robbery. One of them with the kidnap and false imprisonment of the bank's manager, Roger Ball, and his family. And last June, we asked for your help with the inquiry into the murder of Joan McCann in Hertfordshire. She was a well-known dog breeder and had been decorated by General Eisenhower for her bravery during the Second World War. But well, you might perhaps have heard that a woman has been charged with her murder, but inquiries are still continuing. And last March, we reconstructed the last days of Lynette White, a prostitute who worked in the Tiger Bay district of Cardiff. In fact, five men have now been charged with Lynette's murder. Now to Aladdin's Cave, a treasure house of property recovered by police. It may be stolen. It may even have been stolen from you. It comes from all around the country. And here to take us through it, since John Bly can't be with us this month, is his Antiques Roadshow colleague, Eric Knowles. Thank you, Nick. Well, it's always those very personal objects that can offer the police the best clues. And a couple that we've brought today are two certificates. The first, which was given to Private Ernest Smith, he served in the West Yorkshire Regiment in the First World War, and the second was given to Brother Collinson, who was an odd fellow. I think the less said about that, the better. The next item is, well, it's a complete, and it's just a mystery to me, which is a strange painting. It was painted by somebody called J. Sheffield, or G. Sheffield, and it shows a bearded gentleman, obviously Victorian, sat with a very bemused expression, listening to a very intense lady playing at the piano. And next to her, 
um, is what appears to be a ghostly apparition. The poor girl's got her hands over her ears. I can only assume that the, uh, there's a certain amount of discord there. Now, moving from the mysterious to the rather sinister, and this gives me the shivers just holding it, it's a Cogswell and Harrison 12-bore shotgun, or it was. It's now an extremely offensive weapon. It's a 12-bore, well, it's, as you can see, it's a sawn-off shotgun. Cogswell and Harrison, I'm told, were good makers, and this, in perfect condition, would have been worth a considerable amount of money. Moving from the sinister more to the, let's say, the tame, a nice little collection, and it is a collection, of Victorian fairings, the sort of thing that you would be given for knocking a coconut off a shy at a fair in the 1890s, and the sort of thing also that today has been replaced by perhaps the goldfish in the, black, in the plastic bag. They've suffered the ravages of time, and so too has this vase here, which you can see has got its original Victorian rivets. English porcelain, about 1830. Now, a pair of vases. You would be forgiven for saying, ah, they're Chinese export porcelain of 1750. Alas, I'm afraid they're by that famous French and Mr. Samson. But they're nice quality, made in France in the 1880s. And an unusual feature, they've got nice ormolu bases. That's a particularly French trick. Now, moving from the fake to the real thing, this is an important figure. It's a Rita. It was made in about 1680. It is worth at least £5,000. From moving down in scale, we move to a very fine quality Japanese ivory figure of a farmer. Carved from a single piece, makes it desirable, and it forms part of a collection. Last but not least, how are you for time? I'm running out. Either way, if you're looking at a grandfather clock that doesn't have its mechanism, here's one from Batty's of Manchester, proving that we always have the time of day for people in Lancashire. Sue. And the number to ring is ever if you think any of those things could be yours, 01811 8055, 01811 8055. Now for this month's incident desk, where we invite the police to appeal to you directly. How vandals derailed an express train in Dorset, almost causing another major train disaster. An argument in a ticket queue at Waterloo that turned to murder. The hunt for a crucial clue, a distinctive ring that was stolen during a rape in Bath. And the theft of pictures from the Liverpool Polytechnic, the artist, was John Lennon. Here's Superintendent David Hatcher. First, that murder in London. On the evening of Friday the 9th of December last year, Glaswegian John Heron was fatally stabbed at Waterloo Station. We think Mr Heron caught the 7.47 train that evening from Bracknell in Berkshire, arriving at Waterloo at 8.43. He then joined the queue at the information centre. As he was waiting, the man in front of him walked away briefly. When he returned to the front of the queue, John Heron told him to get to the back as he'd lost his place. They had a heated argument and the man seemed to leave. Seconds later, he stabbed John Heron in the back and arm. As he collapsed on the floor, his murderer ran out onto the station concourse and fled through the arch. We're not sure whether he went left down York Road or right to the taxi rank. Have a look at our video fit of the man. He's described as white, aged 35 to 45, 5 foot 10 inches tall, medium build, with dark brown hair, and had a generally scruffy appearance at the time. According to witnesses, he spoke with a strong Scottish accent. Ten minutes before the incident, in the travel centre, a Scotsman had questioned the price of his capital card from Slough to Paddington. He went next door to the information centre to check it. He'd like to talk to this man, or anyone who might have information about the murder. There's a substantial reward, so if you can help, ring us now. Next, colleagues in Avon and Somerset need your help in catching a particularly vicious rapist. Between 1 and 2 p.m. on Wednesday the 8th of June in Camden Crescent, Bath, a woman was raped at knife point when a man forced his way into her basement flat. She's helped us make up this video fit of the rapist. He's Afro-Caribbean in his early 20s, about 5 foot 9 inches tall, clean-shaven with short hair. He was wearing grey, baggy corduroy trousers, a darkish check shirt and a dark grey or black jacket. Just before the attack, a man of the same description was seen round the corner at the front door of the Fountain House Hotel in Lansdowne Road. The rapist also stole a very unusual family ring from the woman. It's one of only three which exist and is gold with a seal showing a pelican emerging from a crown. If you recognise this man or have seen the ring, please get in touch. Next, British Transport Police need your help to solve a serious train derailment in Dorset. 
On Sunday the 11th of December, a fast train travelling from Waterloo to Weymouth hit a cement mixer, which vandals had placed on the line at Parkstone, a suburb of Poole. The collision forced the front carriages off the rails, but the train ploughed on, out of control for about half a mile. It eventually came to a halt, perched precariously on a bridge. Thankfully, no one was hurt, but the damage to the train and the track will cost over half a million pounds to repair. We urgently need to speak to three young men who may have crucial information about the incident. At 6.57pm on Sunday the 11th of December, they boarded the Waterloo to Pool train at Bournemouth. As it went on to Branksome, they were noisy and harassed passengers. It was a slow train stopping at all stations between. Here at Parkstone, several passengers got off, including the young men. The train continued on to Poole. Just 13 minutes later, as the fast train passed through Parkstone, the collision occurred. In those 13 minutes, the cement mixer had been deliberately moved off the station platform onto the track. The first man is 18 or 19 years old, slim, with short brown hair. He was wearing blue jeans and a black leather jacket. The second is also 18 or 19, with fair hair in a crew cut and wearing jeans and a denim jacket. The third was similar in height and age and also had fair hair in a crew cut. If you recognise them or have any information at all, then call us now. Finally, an item of nostalgia from my youth. In 1984, Yoko Ono presented a set of 14 prints like these to Liverpool Polytechnic's School of Art and Design. But sometime on the 11th of December last year, they were stolen. The drawing, drawings were all done by ex-Beatle John Lennon, who studied art there in the 1950s. One of the drawings features the famous Bed In for Peace, where John and Yoko appeared in bed at a press conference to appeal for world peace and love. Since John Lennon's death in 1981, the sketches have rocketed in value. Just recently, a set was sold for £20,000. The drawings were in a white vinyl portfolio with the name of the collection, Bag One, on the front. And they were all signed by John Lennon. The sketches are part of a limited edition of just 300 sets. So if you've been offered them, call us now. And here's the number. If you think you can help, 01811 8055. 01811 8055. Now, anyone who was in Blackpool on the weekend the illuminations were switched off at the end of the summer season may be able to help police working on our next case. It was, like our first case, Guy Fawkes weekend. That Saturday, the 5th of November, was the last day anyone saw 74-year-old Harry Howell alive. Two weeks later, his body was found in the living room of his flat. He'd been robbed and killed. Harry's wife, Elsie, died just four weeks earlier. And since then, he seems to have been a rather lonely figure, living by himself in sheltered accommodation for elderly people in Blackpool. Our reconstruction, which includes actors as well as actual witnesses, begins back in October at Elsie's funeral, where a nephew was particularly concerned about him. Have you thought about what you're going to do now? Oh, I'll, I'll manage. I've, uh, I've got a fair bit put away, you know. No, I don't mean... I mean, how are you going to cope? Oh, I'll manage somehow. Well, what about your meals? Well, we'll think of some of us. Shortly after Elsie's funeral, Harry's nephew took him to the Leagate Cafe in Central Drive, very near Harry's home. Hello, love. This is Harry. He just lives round back in. He's had a bereavement, you know, his mm -hmm. wife's died. Yeah. So he'll be coming in here every day now for his meals, mm -hmm. and I'd like you to look after him. Make sure he has a substantial meal, yeah, well, at do. least one a day. Yeah. No sandwiches or nothing like that. No, no. Harry had suffered a stroke which partly paralysed him and he was blind in one eye. But he was an independent type and he enjoyed placing a bet and having a pint. He used to carry a large amount of money in his wallet and he made a point of telling people he was well off. Recently he'd been going to the George pub around the corner from his home. Police would like to know of anyone seen talking to him there. Harry lived in sheltered accommodation in Ibbotson Court, where every morning the warden visits the elderly residents. It's Saturday the 5th of November. I see you've got your flat nice and tidy now, mm. Harry. I see you've got your flat nice and tidy oh, now, Oh, Harry. yes, fine. Yes. Have you got rid of all Elsie's things? Mm. A social worker came round and, and took them away for somebody more needy like. Yes, yes. OK, love. Right. All right, then. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 
The warden left Harry at half past nine that morning. An hour later, he was having his breakfast at the Legate Cafe as usual. The waitress remembers serving a well-dressed man she hadn't seen before. 20 pence, is it? Yes, thank you very much. And you just listen you. there to Mike Lancaster, our reporter, who's over there at the moment at the British Gas Showroom in Blackburn, cooking for bonfire night tonight. The two men talked together for a while. Sure, yeah, sure. I knew he was with you, I would have brought the tea down myself. Oh, never mind, love. Take your tea out of that, will you? It's already paid. Police would like this man to come forward. Okay, don't worry. Hello, uh, I'm coming for a couple of meat sandwiches for an old man that comes here regularly every day. Uh, perhaps you know him. This is Burton's Bakery on Central Drive, where Harry usually bought a pie at lunchtime. That's all we've got left. Well, I won't want a salad. He definitely said meat. Uh, in that case, I'd better take the uh, the beef and horse ready, please. Horse Would you like one or two? Uh, two, please. Yeah. Yeah. Two weeks later, two beef and horseradish sandwiches were found unopened in Harry's flat, still in the paper bag. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. These were the only beef sandwiches the bakery sold on the 5th of November. From the description the shop assistant has been able to give, police have produced this video fit of the man. It's obviously vital to their inquiries that he comes forward. I've lost my wife recently. Harry enjoyed chatting to people. On that Saturday afternoon at about four o'clock, he kept these complete strangers talking for nearly 20 minutes. I'm no worries on that score. I've, I've plenty of money stashed away, you know. Oh, I, I, I'll be all right. Oh, oh. That's not fair, is it? Oh, no. I, I, I'd like a dog, but I can't have one where I live, you know. You that, no, that'd keep the yobbos away, wouldn't it? Right, yeah. <laughs> Harry didn't mix much with the other residents in Ibbotson Court, and no one knows whether he spent Guy Fawkes' night alone or not. On Sunday morning, the milkman delivered Harry's usual pint. The warden uses an internal intercom to check residents on Sundays, and that morning she remembers Harry answered and said he was fine. Next day, on Monday, the warden on her usual rounds noticed a piece of white card stuck to Harry's door. It was the system residents used to signify they'd gone out for a while. On Tuesday, the 8th of November, at around half past seven, the milkman called again. The white card was still in the door glass. About an hour later, the home help sent by the social services arrived. She was the first to see a note, something like this, addressed to the milkman. But the milkman hadn't seen it. Half an hour after that, the deputy warden passed by on the regular round. She too remembers seeing a note. The window cleaner who came round that afternoon didn't see a note. So what had happened to it? As he worked, the window cleaner saw a man go up to Harry's door. He didn't get a reply and after a while walked off. On Thursday, four days after the warden had last heard Harry's voice, the milkman called again. Seeing Tuesday's bottle still there, he assumed Harry had gone away without telling him and took it away. It wasn't until 12 days later that it was realised something was wrong. On Tuesday, the 22nd of November, the window cleaner came round again. He was the first person to notice that Harry's door had been damaged, although it was still firmly locked. 
concerned, the window cleaner went to the back to investigate. He saw Harry's body lying in an armchair in the lounge. Harry died of terrible head wounds. Mr Hacking, it's extraordinary that nobody saw the damage to the door for nearly two weeks. That's right, yes. Mr Johnson, the window cleaner, was the first person to see it, but uh, there's quite a bit of damage. It looks very much like there's been a burglary, but, of course, the damage could have been caused afterwards in order to cover up a burglary. If it is burglary, there was certainly a, quite a lot stolen. For a start, there was a, a quite distinctive watch, wasn't there? That's right, yes. Um, he had this watch, Mr Howell. It belonged, actually, to his lifelong companion, Elsie Flegg. And on, on the watch, he's printed the words presented to Harry Flegg on his retirement, a word to that effect. It's a gold watch with a gold rim and is quite valuable. And some the keys were stolen, weren't they? In addition, there were keys to the home were stolen as well, about 12 keys on a bunch. Right, and the brown wallet? That's some, right. Something similar to the one you had uh, there? Uh, a wallet similar to this was also stolen. It's uh, just an ordinary brown fold-over type wallet. And we know that in that wallet, Mr Howell has in the past kept several hundred pounds. Right. What about this note? It's a complete mystery. It was pinned to the door probably for only half an hour. Who wrote it, who put it there and why? That's right, yes. It was, it was seen there on Tuesday the 8th of November. It was either put there by Mr Howell or by his killer. Now, the indications are that Mr Howell didn't put it there. There was no indication that he was going away anywhere. He hasn't put notes of that sort there before. So, in, in all probability, it was the person who was connected with Mr Howell's death who put that note there. Right. Now, we're looking in particular for two men. The man, first of all, who went into Burton's Bakery that Saturday for a, some beef and horseradish sandwiches for an old man, as he said. Could we have his description? That's right, yes. The, the man who went into Burton's Bakery, he was quite a tall man. He was, he was slim, uh, with a pale, drawn face, uh, with dark hair that fell over his face, over his forehead. And the second man was the man seen on the morning of that same day talking to Harry in the cafe as he ate his breakfast. That's right, yes. This man seen in the cafe with Mr Howell, he again was quite tall. He was described as broadish built, but he was wearing um, a fawn-coloured overcoat with a trilby hat, with a soft trilby hat. Right, there's always a possibility that's the same man. I hope there you get lots it. of calls, Mr Hacking. Thank you very much. If you can help Detective Superintendent Hacking with any information on this case, please do call. Perhaps you saw Harry or chatted to him at the Leagate Cafe or at the George Pub. The number here is 01811 or the direct line to the incident room in Blackpool is 0253 293933. That's 0253-293933. And we are getting a very high volume of calls tonight uh, on the Mersey House attacks. We've heard that a police officer thinks he recognises a theme in our reconstruction, and we may be onto something on that one. And we've got a lot of calls, too, on the Aladdin's Cave. They're coming in faster than we can report them, but do join us in about an hour's time for Crime Watch Update, when, as I say, I think we'll have a lot to tell you. We hope we'll be able to tell you a great deal then, and more still tomorrow, in the update at 11.20 on open air tomorrow morning. Don't forget, the lines here will stay until midnight. We'll give you local numbers in a moment. You'll also find them on CFAX on page 186. Or, of course, you can always write to us. That's Crime Watch UK, BBC TV, London, W12, 7RJ. Do reflect on the fact that we've distilled several months of serious crime into the last 45 minutes. So, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night. <laughs>